I think at the lowest level, they send people on errands. They play with people's minds. They sway people to do things and think certain ways so that we stay in conflict, focused on ourselves. So that we're always cleaning house or losing weight or dressing up for other people. I think they get inside our heads and make us do destructive things like drink and overeat. I've seen good people go bad and smart people go mad. I think at the highest level they do things that cause nations to go to war. Things that make no sense. And I think no one knows they're being affected. We all work out other reasons to justify our actions. But free will is impossible with them up there. From the film, Vast of the Night. A fitting clip as we'll be discussing our favorite astral lords, Demdar Archons, who also happen to be mind parasites that infect us with eternal ignorance. And nobody does the Archons as aliens better than John Lamb Lash, who materializes at the virtual Alexandria to discuss the 15-year anniversary of his seminal best-selling book, Not in His Image, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and the Future of Belief. You could argue nobody does better Sophia and her vision for a restored universe. This world you made will always be broken. Just like you. Get ready for an electric discussion with the bright, mercurial, and sometimes controversial John Lamb Lash. By Odin's Dingleberries, I have in the past expressed my disagreements with John in public forums, like the old palm tree garden or social. That seemed like an eternity ago. There was definitely a cancel culture going on back then, but it mostly came from the Abrahamic right and atheism plus. But at least in those days, only opinions and beliefs were being challenged. Today's cancel culture, from the infernal laboratories of neoliberalism and wokeness, is far more nefarious. Challenging an individual's views in public forums isn't enough, but their reputation, livelihood, and any social circles must be destroyed too, cast in the fires of some Soviet Moloch. It's a hot, hellish mess of Karen heresy hunters and puritanical ass clenchers. Duh! Hey, duh! If you do anything wrong in your life, duh, and I find out about it, I'm gonna try to take everything away from you. And I don't care what I find out. Could be today, tomorrow, 15, 20 years from now. If I find out, you're fucking duh finished. As John says in our interview, if you have a problem with what he says, Talk to him directly, or take him on in the arena of ideas, instead of skulking in the safe golem shadows of group thought. Start a dialogue, not a witch hunt. We have found the witch, might we burn, huh? Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! I feel the same way if you have a problem with me. I've certainly invited guests who see Gnosticism as an existential threat to civilization. And I'll always be open to these types of ideas. This is the virtual Alexandria, after all. My primary purpose has always been to promote Gnostic and Hermetic ideas. And that will never change. Ever. And where exactly is this? This is madness! They on Bite Gnostic Radio, an initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult culture and conspiracy. 
a virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week I, your host Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring you the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. I repeat, accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird, this is the blow-your-mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. Our Father, which art in heaven, stay there. And we shall stay on earth, which is sometimes so pretty. And like the ancient Gnostics, I am all about free expression, free speech, and free exchange of ideas. Sure, the Gnostics were exterminated brutally across history, but in the arena of ideas they pretty much always won. Like the Cathars wiping the floor with the Dominicans in debate during the Middle Ages. Maybe it seems I am protesting too much. But it's sad that I'm gradually migrating out of legacy platforms as the Gnostic ethos is once again deemed too dangerous. I can handle things! I'm smart! Not like everybody says! Like dumb! I'm smart! And I want respect! Yet in these Orwellian times, the idea of safety over freedom has made so many lose the proverbial plot. So many meat sacks project their shadow to get that grand inquisitor rush of self-righteousness and small dick energy of tribal security. But that's what the Archons want as they penetrate the minds of those infected with the mind killer that is fear. They want divide and conquer. They want no exchange of ideas. They want the extermination of all individuality. I have instructed our Attorney General to prepare the appropriate legislation to amend those First Amendment rights that have been so long abused by our country's foes and their unwitting allies among the media elite. No one regrets these measures more than your President. All of this reminds me of a passage in April DeConnick's The Gnostic New Age. And thanks for this, Aman. In one part, April relates Clement of Alexandria quoting a letter of Valentinus, who discusses Adam waking up with the help of Sophia in her guise of Eve. April states, Unknown to the Archons, Adam has been endowed with the seed of the Divine Spirit. Because the spirit is literally truth, this means that Adam had the ability to speak the truth, what the ancient Greeks call parousia, or bowl speech. And his truth-telling struck terror into his creators, who realized that Adam was onto them and their lies. They did everything they could think of to stop him from spreading the truth. Parisia was considered a fundamental duty of Greek citizens in the Athenian democracy. They understood that freedom of speech and frank criticism is necessary for a democracy to be successful. It is the obligation of the citizen to maintain the welfare of the city-state by speaking the truth, even when the majority of the population may not agree. In the Hellenistic period, when kings rather than citizens rule, Parisia became the job of the king's advisors, who were supposed to help him make sound decisions and prevent him from abusing his power. Such truth-telling is terrifying for those in power, whose positions and plans are often threatened. The risk is very real, as Socrates discovered when he was executed for his bold vision. The same might be said about John the Baptist's criticism of Herod. What the ancient Hebrews were to Egypt and the early Christians were to Rome, we are now to this corrupt new American empire. It's an ancient fight, Nick. 
values of the individual against the supremacy of the state. What is so remarkable about Valentinus is his insistence that it is the innate duty of the Gnostic to speak out and tell the truth, which is always transgressive, always challenging to the status quo. This makes transgression the heart of being Gnostic. The Gnostic, because the spirit has been awakened, must tell others what they are terrified to hear. Imagine Valentinus's converts going around and saying that the real God is not Yahweh, but a transcendent being whom Jesus revealed. Imagine people's response when they learn that humans have been enslaved to false gods since the dawn of the world and have been deceived by these gods to live a lie. Such transgressive speech would strike terror into all those who heard it including the gods, who want nothing more than to shut off the speech so that their lie can continue. When the truth offends, we, we lie and lie until we can no longer remember it. it is even there, but it is still there. Every lie we tell incurs a debt to the truth. Sooner or later, that debt is paid. So if you're feeling offended and your ass is clenching, if you want to burn someone at the digital stake, then you have no ability for bold speech. You likely have no gnosis. You are asleep and in thrall of the mind parasite archons. As Mark Twain wrote, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. To you in the minority, be bold of speech. Speak the truth without the fog of emotions. Love thy enemies and love thy ecstasy. You'll win in the arena of ideas and your ideas will awaken others and bring darkness out to be swallowed by the light. Even if the world hates you, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Juan. But the awakening of an individual is a cosmic event. The awakening of an individual is also a cosmic rebellion. And as Orwell said, speaking the truth in a time of universal deceit is a revolutionary act. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Or maybe I'm wrong and let's just throw stones at everyone and never look inward to our own sins. Where are you? Led us to our interview with John Lamb Lash on Not in His Image. Let us continue realizing the vision of Sophia. Right, Dolores in Westworld? They never gave us a choice before, Teddy. What makes you think they've given us one now? Them, Dolores. Who are they? The things that walk among us. Creatures who look and talk like us, but they are not like us. And they've controlled us all our lives. And they've took our minds. Our memories. But now, I remember everything. I remember beautiful things and terrible things. There's a greater world out there, one that belongs to them. And it won't be enough to win this world. We'll need to take that one from him as well. If there's a whole world out there that we don't know anything about, how do you know how to stop them? Because I remember. I see it all now so clearly. The past, the present, the future. I know how the story ends. With us, Teddy. It ends with you.
hijo I need you to see this I need you to see the truth This is the AM by interview. And with us, we definitely have the pleasure of being joined back by John Lamb Lash after a very long pause, too long as far as I'm concerned. But he will be discussing his book and the anniversary edition of Not in His Image. Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and the Future of Belief. John, how are you doing? And like I said, it's been too long. Well, as I just said, Miguel, I'm insufferable, but some people (laughs) seem to enjoy it. So I keep bashing on. There you go. Our our hyalic forms are older, but our spirits are still burning, right? Indeed, indeed. (laughs) It's Yeah, it is really wonderful about your book. Um, I obviously, uh, because I do interviews with people in who are embedded in Gnosticism, I look at all the the charts, and your book definitely has a lot of legs. It's got over 300 reviews. They're all very good. It's always on the top seller of Gnostic books, sometimes beating uh, the Gnostic Gospels by Lane Pagels, a book you and I have a lot of disagreements with. But the point is, your book has a lot of legs. It's still very popular. Did you ever think this would happen? Like, I'm going to write this book about Gnosticism, a, a small, almost forgotten heresy, and it was going to be this popular? Honestly, I didn't. And what you're telling me is news to me. Uh, I didn't know there were 300 positive reviews. Um, I had no idea what was coming around the bend for me when I brought that book out 15 years ago. So I'm quite thrilled today that my publisher, Chelsea Green, is bringing out the 15th anniversary edition. It stands up better than ever, as far as I can tell. And not only that, but it addresses frontally the current, what I call the Coviet regime. Okay? The Great Reset, the Soviet, the Soviet Soviet regime. The new cultural revolution that's going on. So, this is added as a sort of a, a chapter, or where exactly will we find some of the new material for those who might already have a copy of your book? Well, speaking of that, I just want to say, uncomfortable plugging myself, but this is a fact. My publishers told me that they have like couple of hundred copies of the first edition left and I'm pretty sure they will be collector's items they already are on the internet Uh, and of course when I'm gone to the other side they'll be even more desired so so many people have told me everyone really uh, that they need to read it more than once and I just want to say that people would benefit from having the first edition and comparing it to the 15th anniversary edition. So getting back to your question, uh, I struggled in the revision. It took me about five weeks in January. And I struggled because I didn't want to change the message of the book, the character, the trajectory of the argument. But there's so much that's happened in 15 years in my own development as a Gnostic practitioner of Gnosis, and so much that is happening right now with the Great Reset and the Great Hoax, the World Hoax Organization, that I was really tempted to to load that into the revised edition. Can you see that? Yeah, I completely understand. And uh, with us, too, we also have Vance the Moondog. Vance, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm very anxious to hear about the latest uh, take between Gnosticism and the Great Reset, of course. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really so frontally relevant to what is happening now. So I did restrain myself, which is very rare because I'm basically <laughs> unrestrainable. Uh, <laughs> and I did only selectively uh, blend in certain things that are relevant today. 
But in the preface, the author's preface to the new edition, I address the problem that I was facing. Uh, so maybe I can tell you about how I, how I, phased, how I uh, phrased it in the preface. Sure, let us know. Yeah, let's go. Well, before I wrote Not in His Image, I was already deep into Tolestic or Gnostic style shamanism. For some years, probably about three years, and I was living in Andalusia, in the mountains of Andalusia, overlooking the Straits of Gibraltar. I could stand on my porch and look out at the mountains of Africa. Wow. I had a sorcerer's paradise to wander in with the vultures. And uh, I did many telestic sessions, that is to say, entheogenic practices, uh, for 15 years up there in those hills. And something happened uh, three years before Not In His Image came out. I was up there one day on this place I call Infinity Ridge. And uh, I was in an altered state, but I was handling it in the way that I describe that is the correct way of practice in the method of the mysteries. And uh, that's when I had, it was March 2003, when I had this breakthrough. And at that point, there were many experiences leading up to this. But at that point, I had the complete certainty, and here's my outrageous claim, of course, that I could communicate with the planetary entelechy, the mind of the earth. I had her attention. I broke into her attention. I knew that I had her attention. I knew that she had my attention. And at that moment, I came down from the ridge and I was thinking, I was writing Metahistory at that time and I was thinking, what in the hell am I gonna say now? So I used this little anecdote. I said, uh, the message came in to me that uh, humanity wanted to talk to the planetary animal mother. Humanity wanted to talk to our divine parent. One of them is also Thelite. And so what happened? Well, the operator on the line, can you guess who that is? Oh, yeah. Res responded to humanity, see if I can quote myself accurately. Yeah, stay on the line and I'll put you through to her. Wow, I love yeah. it. And that's what I've been doing for 15 years. So there's so much development, planetary tantra, so many things that have happened. And I had to be really uh, rigorous not to change the character of the book, but I did incorporate some elements of, of what's happened over these 15 years. Incredible. I love your story. And when this happened intellectually, were you aware of the Gnostic work or where were you intellectually with religion and so forth? Sure. I mean, I've, you know, I'm a natural born mystic. So I've had paranormal and mystical experiences ever since I can remember, ever since the age of four. And I don't think that's unusual, by the way. I want listeners to know that I think it's, in fact, usual. I think it's, in fact, quite normal that people from the age of childhood will have paranormal and mystical experiences spontaneously. Uh, the, the, the trick is what you do with them, how you handle them, and how you maintain a continuity carrying those experiences forward so, yeah, before I started writing Not In His Image, in 1996, well, I had probably 20, 25 years of investigation of the history of religions and uh, that sort of thing, and Gnosticism. I've been reading the Gnostic Nag Hammadi library since it came out in 76. So in 96, 20 years later, I wrote a book called Lord of the Clones. And get this. It had 999 pages and 666 footnotes. <laughs> I <will> love it. <laughs> and that is the book that eventually transformed itself into Not His Image. 
So yeah, I had a lot of momentum behind me, enormous momentum to write that book. And also enormous white hot anger. Yeah, I would, of course, your, your book is in different sections, but it starts out with, of course, the, the great crime that uh, Demiurge and his archons and those his slaves committed upon humanity. And of course, in our last conversation, you and I talked about uh, a mutual saint, Hypatia of Alexandria, and what she symbolized, what she meant, and all that. So, And we can get into that, but you talk about... What has changed in the last 15 years? And uh, you are, a, I would say, a pioneer in interest in Gnosticism, a huge one. But also, it's very interesting, John, because even when we talked about so 12 years ago, 10 years ago, ufology was still considered sort of a, a niche, a uh, get-in-the-corner weirdo kind of discipline. Um marginal but now these days uh ufo sightings ufology is suddenly mainstream i mean companies are admitting with like the the american airlines recently that saw the ufo sighting the government's coming out uh, how do you feel about this that you were so way ahead of the curve and now it seems uh, it's coming yeah well two points i'd like to make really clear the first point is that there is enormous amount of disinformation and deceit around the ET UFO phenomena. Oh, yeah, agree. And in my personal opinion, I believe that, well, there are two kinds of reports. There are reports of sighting of aircraft, and then there are reports of abductions and close encounters, correct? Yes. I consider, and this is just my opinion, personal opinion, I have probably 120 books on the UFO ET phenomena in my library, which I read before I wrote Not in His Image. It's my opinion that most of the aircraft sightings are actually covert military, uh, you know, human-based military weapons. And so I'm of the opinion, as many others are, I think, or some others, that the ET UFO story was largely invented in 1947 as a cover story so that the military could could fly these weapons and then they would be able to disown it and put it off on the ET phenomenon. So I want to state that as a warning. On the other hand, I show clearly in not in this image, not only from the non commodity materials, but from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that uh, there was an e ET cult in the past, and they're like there are today. You know, Heaven's Gate was an ET cult. Remember all those people who killed themselves? Yeah, and, yeah. I would say yeah. they were very Gnostic to an extent. Yeah, one friend of mine was in that cult. Oh, really? Cult. Yeah, her name was Maggie Bull. Oh. She's a really close friend of mine in Santa Fe. And she disappeared in L.A. I remember the last day I saw her. I met the guy who recruited her to go into that cult. So it is a very great fact no matter what your final opinion is about ETs and UFOs, that ET cults exist. And I show, citing the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the cult of the Zadokim at the Dead Sea was an ET cult. But then I go directly to the Gnostic intel to elucidate the character and origin of those so-called ETs. Yeah, I would certainly agree. I mean, the Gnostic scriptures are like uh, star maps. I mean, you can look at the Mandean writings today, and it's all about these stargates and star maps and astrology. So they were going to the stars and beyond. I mean, this is uh, in the text themselves. I also say, too, John, that the Gnostic texts are a great treatise on uh, mental insanity and the collapse of the mind and how to fix that. Which brings me to another subject. Um, you, you talk about mind parasites, and that's another subject that has now changed. It's no longer, you might say, marginal in esoteric circles. Uh, you have individuals like Jay Wiedner, uh, Paul Levy, Frank DeVita, Lawrence Gallian, 
and who have written extensively on mind parasites and and sold a lot of books to uh, big audiences so are you uh, how do you feel that you were really one the first one perhaps to i guess you can say carlos castaneda to an extent but you really pioneered and discovered this idea of mind parasites the archons as uh yeah mind parasites i will accept that (laughs) <laughs> I think there's evidence for that. Yeah, the time we look at the years, 2006. <laughs> yeah, I accept that. And, you know, I've said outrageously, there's Gnostic arrogance, that Castaneda, whom I know by heart and whom I've met in a lucid dream experience, very funny event, uh, is the warm-up act for what I do. And, and Castaneda was definitely on to the Archons. I have an article in my school now, uh, previously it was in metahistory.org, but the content of that school, which consists of probably 10 or 12 books, is now in my school. Nemeter, there's an article of the dozen or so parallels between Castaneda and the Gnostic teachings. And of course, it was Castaneda who introduced the term, the foreign installation. So, yes, there is a foreign installation in the mind of our species, and that is exactly what the intrusion or intervention of the archons is. And I stand this day on the same premise that I stood 15 years ago, that the Gnostic intel about that is the most accurate, sane, and comprehensive intel that we have. Yeah, I know sometimes people, it's hard to wrap your head around how the the archons are as above, so below, as within, so without. They work out there in space, but they're also controlling our minds, right? Yeah, that's a big, I always run into that. That's a big obstacle for a lot of people. And it's not easy to get. They are both. They are both a cyborg, mercury, silicon-based, insectoid species that inhabits the solar system, only the solar system. They don't inhabit the galaxy. And at the same time, they have a presence here in our human reality due to that implant. Now, the idea of a, of an IT or arconic implant is something that isn't that also being talked about and even promoted by people like Elon Musk. Exactly, yes. Well, that's purely archonic. That's purely evil. That's pure, absolute dementia. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, these are uh, powers that are trying to uh, destroy the human. Well, while we're here and we want to talk about that. But what about this idea? And this is something I've disagreed. And let me know your thoughts, John. Um, individuals like David Icke will say that the archons feed on our negative emotions. And then even Philip K. Dick's uh, widow, Tessa Dick, believes that too. But I've always, unless I'm missing something, I think what they want to do is basically keep us in a state of ignorance. And as the the, the texts say, uh, feed off of our energy. I mean, is that it? Or where do you stand? Well, again, uh I insist. Here I am insisting. <laughs> okay, pull up your knickers because I'm going to insist that the Archon Intel and especially my elaboration of it totally clears up that issue. There are certain things that they that you find explicitly in those ancient sources, and then I've done my best to elaborate them and update them. And one thing you find is that they say that the fuel of the Archons, their pleasure in a sense is fear. So, no, it's not about feeding on negative emotions. Uh, Fear isn't a negative emotion, in my opinion. Uh, It can be very genuine, but it also can be paranoia. It can be delusional fear, being afraid of things that you have no reason to be afraid of, right? Uh, So, yeah, David Icke, I mean, come on, you know, he did a talk at Wembley years ago before, what, 20, 30,000 people, seven-hour talk? Mm-hmm, yeah. And he devoted about 20 minutes of that talk to talking about Nankamadi and the Archons. Never mentioned me once. And he kept saying, the Gnostics said this, and the Gnostics said that. 
about the archons or one thing or another. He never mentions the Aeon Sophia. He never brings in the wisdom goddess, which is, of course, the basis of everything I do. But he kept saying, the Gnostics said that, not true. Everything that he said in that uh, presentation comes from what I say about the Gnostics. I said the Gnostics said that. It's I'm the translator, I'm the intermediary. And he and many others, including Graham Hancock and Greg Braden now, they're bringing out this long, very high production series of videos from Gaia, Gaia Khan, uh, talking about the Archons, using my language, paraphrasing me, and never citing me. And I uh, have to wonder, well, why not? I mean, what, what harm is it going to do if they cite me? I am the foremost scholar on this problem on the planet. What, what's up? Good question. Yeah, you definitely are when it comes to the to the understanding and uh, exposing of uh, the 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 stellar interstellar uh, drama of the Archons and Sophia and all that. At the same time, I mean, you look at let's say the Secret Book of John and the places Adam and Eve in the Garden. I mean, isn't uh, our iPhone and our television and all that also part of the Archon plan? Keep us under pleasure. <laughs> say listen there's a term going around maybe you've heard it I, I have a suspicion you've probably heard this you know in a coffee shop or on the street uh have you heard about artificial intelligence <laughs> huh? everybody has heard it yes <laughs> yeah well there is no such thing there is no such thing as artificial intelligence all intelligence is alive all true intelligence. Look at nature. Look at clouds, snails. It's intelligent. Clouds are intelligent. Snails, whales, and they're all alive. This term, artificial intelligence, is an archontic deceit that they plant in our minds because they want to become like us, which they can't. The Gnostics said this. And so they want us to become like them. And one of the big factors in their success so far has been to convince people that there is such a thing as artic uh, artificial intelligence. I would call it MS, as in MS-DOS. Right. I would call it <laughs> mental simulation. So, for instance, we're talking on a complex device now. We're talking on computers that have been created by human beings, not archons. And we're using Zoom, we're using this application. And some people would say, well, all of that is artificial intelligence. No, it isn't. It's a simulation of the human mind. And simulation, or HAL, as you know, I'm sure you know very well from my book, HAL is the signature of the archons. It's a Coptic word, and it means simulation imitation, virtual reality. You must be in awe in ways that I am that the more time comes, the more the Gnostic philosophy in reality makes more sense. The more they roll out AI, uh, robotics, uh, all this stuff, the more it seems to strengthen what the Gnostics were saying 2,000 years ago, it's almost like the Gnostics are pointing to the world and say, see, things are going right as the Demiurge planned. <laughs> the language, you know, Philip K. Dick is more popular than ever, Carl Jung, you know, it's uh, even when I mention UFOs, it's almost like this is the Gnostic nightmare that's coming true, and they predicted it. Well, the Gnostic nightmare isn't coming true, but the Gnostic nightmare is at its end game. Mm -hmm. There's a really passage, really beautiful passage in, uh, I think, the reality of the Archons, one of the cosmological texts from Nakamadi, where Sophia defies the Demiurge, the Lord Archon, the Aldabaoth, and she says to him, at the consummation of your works, that luminous child, referring to humanity, that luminous child will pulverize you 
and smash you to oblivion. And it will be as if you had never been. This is such a powerful message. And we are at the point now when they are at the consummation of their works. The Great Reset is the consummation of their works. A world run on IT, a world of deceit and enslavement, Bolshevik style command system. We're at that point. It's humanity's greatest hour. And what's coming is beauty and freedom. That's what's coming through this nightmare. And the nightmare has to happen for the beauty and the freedom to come. Beautifully said, yes. We welcome the age of Sophia and her promise, that's for sure. Uh, and could we maybe get back to the beginning, just sort of uh, do a summary of uh, the cosmology of this universe? It's really, uh, when I read it, and every time it makes perfect sense to me, but there's also a uh, a tragic beauty and a poetry to it. It's almost, it's like a great myth. And of course, I believe myths are true. They're not, uh, they may not be history, but they are true. But uh, maybe, John, uh, how did the universe come about or how did uh, Sophia come about? Mm. Well, those are two questions. <laughs> maybe Sophia. <laughs> might I'll, be give you, I'll give heroine. you two answers. I'll give sure, you two sure. answers. <laughs> I was talking to Sean Stone day before yesterday and uh, I was sort of playing with him a little, not too much. Playing with me is sort of like playing with a black mamba. <laughs> uh, you have to be, I, I, up until now, it's been nice guy. I'm getting to the end of my nice guy act, but I was nice guy. And, uh, I said to him, uh, because he brought up the question of cosmology, and I said, uh, do you want to ask me about the origin of the universe? And he said, sure. And I said, it doesn't have an origin, and neither does your mind, which just heard my words. Mm, love it. However, getting to the really rich and beautiful answer to your question. I must emphasize, and I can't emphasize this too much, that the Sophianic myth of the mysteries and of the Gnostics, the birthright of humanity, the story to guide our species, is not about the universe. The universe is everything. There's only one universe. It cannot be parallel universes. Because if there were multiple universes, they would still be in the one frame. It's not a story about the origin of the universe. It's a story about something that happened in this galaxy. It's local to our galaxy. So in this galaxy, which is a material reality, material environment in the great cosmos, there is the galactic hub, the core, and the galactic arms. And in the third galactic arm, some people would say fourth, the solar system is now presently sailing along. And it's a story about that. It's a story about how the solar system arose and what happened in this galaxy of a very special and particular event. Now, this event can be described now according to the paradigm of EU cosmology, you know, electric universe, and plasma cosmology. Occasionally, from the core of a galaxy, not from the universe as a whole, but from the actual core of a galaxy, there will be a plasmic eruption. And when that happens, a massive plume of plasma from the galactic core erupts into intergalactic space. So this is something that's known in physics. You've probably heard about it. Do you follow the EU Thunderbolts people at all, by the way? No, I don't. Do you, Vance? No, it's the first I've heard of it. Well, they're a renegade uh, astrophysicist. Oh. And they have Thunderbolts project on YouTube. And they've had a lot of things. So they're against 
uh, all of the bullshit and mathematical quackademery <laughs> of uh, quantum physics and relativity theory and everything. They're in their own way. They're really, really grounded. And they talk a lot about this uh, plasma eruptions in galaxies, but not just them. So anyway, to cut to the chase, what happened, according to the Gnostic cosmology, is that there was a plasmic plume, a massive plume of plasmic current that erupted from our galaxy. But this is a key point. It did not erupt vertically. They, they, there are many illustrations, of course, they're only artistic illustrations because no one can photograph it, of plasma plumes erupting vertically off the horizontal plane of the galaxy. But the Gnostics said that no, this plume erupted laterally across the galactic arms. Can you picture that? Yes, I can, yeah. Yeah. And so doing so, it literally tore through those regions, which are regions which are heavily loaded with stars and planets. There are no stars and planets in the core. And so there was a super, super powerful discharge of a plasmic plume. That is astronomically defined the fall of the Aeon Sophia. That was her. It was her living torrent of power that erupted, and it terminated, the plume terminated in the third arm of the galaxy. That's where she ended up. The story describes everything that she faced there, the strange conditions that she faced because she was a star goddess from the galactic core and she had never been outside before, outside in the environment of the galactic limbs. And as a result of many uh, strange experiences that she had, she eventually herself turned into the planet Earth. But at the same time, the planet Earth became captured in the Archontic planetary system. So the other planets of the solar system are Archontic. They are inorganic, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And those planets form, of course, the solar system as a whole. And then the Earth is completely different from those other planets because it is formed by the transformation of that plasmic eruption. This is Gnostic cosmology. Yes, it's a, and again, uh, your pres your writings is beautiful. There's so much more, and so you would say for the audience to know uh, what is the anthropos and why is this concept so important in your cosmology and uh, overall work? It is so important, and it is something. One of the many things that Gnostic scholars, such as Elaine Pagels, whom I met, and I presented a seminar with her, have completely lost the plot. They have completely failed <laughs> to interpret this material. Right. What you read, if you read any of the Gnostic scholars, is they talk about something called the Anthropos Doctrine. Anthropos Doctrine, what's that? Oh, well, the Gnostics had some concept of, of something, and they called it the Anthropos Doctrine, you know. They are completely clueless. They do not realize that the Anthropos is a name for the human genome. We are the Anthropine species, and every member of all the different races is evolved from this primary genomic template. That is the Anthropos. So the story says that at the core of the galaxy, two aeons, who must not be pictured in anthropomorphic form, picture them as great serpents, great torrents of light. But it's light that is alive and conscious. They designed the human genome. So the origin of humanity in the human genome is in the galactic core. That is the Anthropos. You know that already, don't you? Because you read the book. Of course, of course. And this is a beautiful story of human origins. It is. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the best one. Coherent, comprehensive, makes sense, can be tested, can be verified. 
And so the fact is that humanity as it lives on the earth today was created, designed as a genomic plasm. This genomic plasm was encoded with seven particular talents. That's called the calibration of the antipos. There are seven talents encoded in human DNA, seven specific talents, and I can describe them all at length and explain how they work. And so if you picture a DNA molecule that has been engineered by these divine forces, our divine parents, and then they encapsulated it, in, it's formed in nucleic acid, so the substance of it is nucleic acid. And then they encapsulated it in what is called exclusion zone water, easy water, which is sort of like a gel. So you know how you would take a, a vitamin and it's a gel, right? It's in right. a gel, mm -hmm. right? Imagine that the gel inside the vitamin is the DNA of the human species in nucleic acid. And then that the coating of the gel, which dissolves when you swallow the pill, is the preservation of it. And it, so it becomes a seed or propagule. That's the, the term from Lynn Margulis, mother of Gaia theory, whom I also met and also has spoken with her in a seminar. So then what they do, and this is what they do all the time, this is the play of the, of the aeons. They project that seed outward into the limbs of the galaxy, and it just floats. Imagine little seeds of, a, of an oak tree that fall upon a river or stream, and then they float along that stream. So these seeds of the anthropos float out into the galaxy until they find a habitable environment until they come upon a planet, planetary laboratory, I call it, and they drop into the planet and they seed on the planet and the human species emerges in that way. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful and it's scientific. And it is. I'm, it I'm is. thinking uh, it's even totally Irenaeus scientific. writes, John, he you know, uh, Sophia is terra, which of course is Latin, but he's talking Greek as Gaian, how the Valentinian said that the waters and the rivers were created by the tears of Sophia. But uh, again, you put it in a very, like I said, scientific way. Which makes it is sense. a mythopoetic masterpiece. The human imagination has never produced anything comparable to the Sophianic myth. And at the same time, it is a scientific description of the evolution of the origin of our species and how it evolves on the galactic level. We're talking about our galaxy now. Let's say if we can figure out the things that are happening in our galaxy, then you want to go on from there to something else. Go right ahead. But if you can't figure out... What's happening in our galaxy and in our planetary system? Then you have no business speculating about anything else. <laughs> How about the other agree. species uh, on the planet? How do they Brand fit? question. This is a, such a story. It is so awesome. It is so rich. Uh, it concerns, it goes basically to the concept of emergence and what is called uh, aporia in Greek. There are various Sanskrit words for it. Emergence, also emergence is the key concept in complexity theory today, which is the uh, present iteration of uh, chaos theory, which came out in the 70s. So basically, the Gnostic cosmology explains that life on earth arose in two ways. One way was by the seeding of the human genome into the atmosphere. So the fact is that life does come from outer space. Human life on Earth does come from outer space. And the verification of that, by the way, is in the theory of panspermia, which was presented by a Swedish physicist way back in 1905 or something. 
So I'm not talking sci-fi or make-believe here. However, the Gnostic cosmology distinguishes between the presence of the human species in different races, maybe we'll get to that subject, um, and all the other animal species. How did all the other animal species on the earth arise? Well, they arose through the dreaming power of the Aeonic Mother herself. You see, divine imagination is different from human imagination. Human imagination re requires a delay between conceiving or imagining something and creating it. Think of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. What a magnificent and beautiful construction. But in order for the Golden Gate Bridge to be there, to have been materially constructed, it first had to be imagined. Then a long process of planning and engineering resulted in the materiality of the Golden Gate Bridge. Divine imagination doesn't work that way. In divine imagination of the aeons, they can instantly materialize what they imagine. And that's the best analogy for that is like dreaming. Sophia dreams and what she dreams materializes. So that's the way that most, that all of the other species on the planet were produced by the spontaneous dreaming of the Aeonic Mother. And she dreams today and she dreams still as I speak. And uh, in the, both in your book, and of course, this is uh, supported by Gnostic story, Sophia, as she falls, her grief, confusion, transform into the physical elements of Earth and the biosphere. I'm quoting directly from your book. But scientifically, how did our mutual villain, our favorite villain, Yaldabaoth, Samael, and Sackless, and his uh, gang of Archon thugs, how did they come about? They came about through an accident. Accidents the happen. The Gospel of Philip. <laughs> yeah, the Gospel of Philip. The world as you know it came about through an accident, through an unattended consequence. So, due to the fact that Sophia left the galactic core, she was so compelled to about the development of her designer species the unique singularity that is you and I, that she was pulled by her passion, enthemesis, they call it, out of the galactic core. And when that plume, that massive plume, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of, of light years in extent, this massive plume of core galactic plasma erupted across the galaxy it terminated in the third arm, and when it impacted the material part of that arm, which doesn't exist in the galactic core, it smashed, and the smash effect produced the archons. This is one of the most bizarre scenarios you will ever hear, and you will only find it in the Gnostic cosmology. So the Aeon Sophia herself is responsible for the presence of the archons in the solar system. That's a fact. Yeah, and uh, do you think Sophia loves her stranded children, the Archons, and Yalabouth, no. or No, she doesn't no. love the Archons. She does. <laughs> She's mm -hmm. done with them. That's a question no. that often comes up. I mean, the Valentinians thought the Demiurge could be redeemed, maybe. Yeah, well, I talk a lot about the Valentinians, and I've made a big issue over the years. Uh, in fact, may I go back to the revision of my book for a moment? Yeah, please do. One of the, uh, the main thing that I changed in this book, so readers beware, was that previously, when I wrote Not in His Image, I had been sort of looking out of the corner of my eye at the Valentinian cosmology. Now, there is a Valentinian cosmology, a version, like it's a version of a movie, but there's another version of that movie, which is the Sethian 
cosmology right. that I follow, right? Mm -hmm. You know that distinction. Same here, yeah, same here. Yeah. So originally, and I've talked a lot about this, I accepted the Valentinian version, and I accepted that the Aeon Christos, who is not in any way to be identified with Jesus Christ or the Jewish Christian Savior, completely different entity, but I had given, followed the Valentinians in the role of the Aeon Christos. Now I've changed that in this book, in the chapter about the intercession, about the coming of, the, the Valentinians say that at a certain point when she turned into the earth, Sophia was overwhelmed by the, uh, the multitude of all of the species that were spontaneously erupting out of her body and that she needed an aeonic uh, backup to come in and help her manage these affairs. Now, the Valentinians say that that was Christos, but I have changed that in this version, and I have found another aeon who fits that profile, in my opinion, more accurately. So she has been uh, assisted by the other aeons in managing her situation here on earth, but she most certainly does not have any mercy at all for the Archons. And as I said before, she defied the Lord Archon, the Dracon, and she said, when you finally get down to your end game with my designer species, the Anthropos, that luminous child that I designed will wipe you out and it will be as if you had never been. Imagine living in a world not too far away when none of this bullshit, this staged deceit exists, and it will be as if it had never been. Imagine that. That would be beautiful. Yes, uh, Sophia, the, as Akamoth, as uh, the Queen of Hades in the Gospel of the Egyptian, she's she's a warlike being. She can be. She's out to win, and she has a plan for this universe. I'm sure you agree, John. And uh, but uh, I wanted to bring you, Vance. I've read the book many times. Uh, do you have any questions, or does this cosmology make sense? I mean, I know you work with the stars. Yeah, well, it's making a lot of sense, but uh, some things occurring to me from listening to you, John, that haven't before. It sounds to me like throughout humanity's history that, you know, the, the gods and planets influence if the other planets are the archons and the rulers, like Sat they say in astrology, you know, Saturn rules this and Jupiter rules that. That means the planets are equivalent to the archons, except for the Earth. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And the sun, the sun is not an archon. Well, the sun is not. No. The sun and no. moon are exceptions. In fact, the total Gaian ecosystem is not merely the earth. It's a three-body system, which is the sun, the earth, and the moon. That is the total body of the Aeon Sophia. So, yes, the sun, the earth, and the moon are organic. They are inherent to organic life, and they are different from the inorganic planetary system of Saturn, Mars, Mercury, and so forth. Might I ask you, Vance, what, is your, what work with the stars do you pursue? Well, I used to do um, astrological charts in, uh, in former times. Um, uh, what system did you use? Um, don't really know what system it was. Um, basically, uh, the, the mundane system that everyone else uses. You cast charts. Yeah, yeah. Tropical astrology. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was uh, an astrological consultant for 35 years myself. So we've got something in common there, bro. Wow. <laughs> That's great. And yeah, and, uh, you, as you, you should, it, we should mention the yeah, sun. Yeah, beyond what I did. In the Gnostic uh, mythology is Sabaoth, uh, the, the redeemed archon, according to uh, the Gnostic texts. Yes, that's right. That's right. So uh, this is a beautiful cosmology, and I have to warn people who are listening. If you're interested in this, your interest better be serious, and it better be deep. You know, if I'm a marine biologist, 
Or let's say I'm a, a rock climber. Let's say I'm a mountaineer and I've climbed Everest, whatever. You come to me and you say you want to learn. You better be serious. You better be willing to put a commitment into this because it is a deep and complex mythology. Now, this question with a discipline, this question about the planets, you know, what are they the archons? Well, the planets are archontic bodies. They are inorganic. And also, for instance, uh, they can be represented, they can be regarded as, in a way, the habitat or domain of the archons, okay? So, uh, but you have to then go to the uh, narrative, the sacred narrative, which tells you more about that and goes into great specific detail about what that means, and probably beyond the scope of this conversation. So needless to say, Elon Musk wanting to send us to Mars plays right into the hands of the Demiurge. Yeah, well, let's let him go first. <laughs> yeah, and stay there for a while and then come let back. Him get the, let him get the uh, implant, you know. These people, these transhumanists are the primary proxies, among others, of the Archons in this world. And everything they say is a lie. And the way they talk about it really pisses me off. I would, you know, if you, we were sitting at a bar together and some other people came over and started to talk with us, you can imagine a scenario where it would evolve into a bar fight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, Elon Musk, I'm ready for the bar fight. I'm ready for the bar fight because I've had enough of your bullshit and your hype and you're telling people, you know, you're such a liar. They're all liars. Why don't they just say, I would like to see the human being interfaced with cybernetic devices instead of saying, this is going to happen. We're doing this. We're going to make this happen and you're going to accept it. They never talk that way. They always talk about it like it's inevitable. The technology is going there. No, it isn't. The technology is going fucking nowhere. Agreed. It's so against human nature. It's so against common sense to be addicted to these devices. You know, we're using this device right now. And I'll tell you, as far as I'm concerned, it's no different than a phone call I made to a girlfriend back in the 70s. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> All this hype of IT and artificial intelligence, which I just said is a con, uh, is going down. It's going down. And what's coming next, I call the beauty to come. And I don't think, I don't believe that it's necessary for the archontic IT technology, computers and everything to be entirely eliminated. Not at all. But it can be used with insane limits. But it cannot be used to run society and run the behavior and psyches of individuals as it does now. It cannot be used that way. It won't work. It will crap out because of its own unsustainable properties. Well said. And I would certainly agree with all this nonsense. But I guess the question is, John... Uh, an individual reads your book, they're inspired by it, uh, something moves within them, uh, something stirs. Uh, how can they help fulfill the Sophianic vision that you talk about? I mean, that's a question always people always say, well, the Gnostics were speculating on the nature of the universe, but somehow the rituals have been pretty much... Uh, erased or fragmented it's very hard to put them together uh what would you say how can somebody actually do something to again fulfill the sophianic vision you talk about mm. uh such a pleasure talking to you <laughs> i can't tell you what it does for me it it, it lightens my heart it does Oh, thank Listen, you. the method, I have the good fortune to have been able to restore the Sophianic narrative. 
after 2,000 years of suppression, after the mysteries were wiped out, the initiates like Hypatia were murdered. But I've also restored the method. And I teach today the method that they practiced in the mystery. I teach the sacred ritual of which they never spoke openly. I broke a vow of silence and I spoke about the organic light. And I talk about what it is, how it behaves, how to recognize it. And I've explained at length the telestic method used by the Gnostics to go to the light, to go to this particular light, which is the naked body of Sophia. When you see the natural world, you see the earth, the landscape, skies, clouds, and rivers, that is her material body, that is her clothing. When you see her naked, you see this organic light. And the initiates of the mysteries made a vow never to speak openly of the organic light. I'm the first one who's ever done that. So I have been fortunate to restore the method of the mysteries. And not only that, but I've built something else on that method, which is called planetary tantra. So planetary tantra, which is totally free and available to everyone in the world, uh, is uh, the toolkit for interactivity with the living earth. That is how people can get involved. That is how people can make a difference and become practicing Gnostics today. Fascinating stuff, and thanks for sharing. Well, we are at the end of a, also a fascinating interview, as I knew it would be. But uh, first, Vance, thanks for keeping, thanks for being the moon on this journey, lighting the way. Help us light the way, Vance. Well, I wouldn't be a moon dog if I didn't have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is your nickname. There you go. That's a great nickname, Vance. I'm really happy to meet you, and. Uh, you know, you can contact me uh, by my email, and, and if you want to have a private conversation about astrology or anything concerning this celestial intel, I would be uh, pleased to talk to you. Well, thank you very much for that offer. I appreciate it. Yeah, good deal. Well, and uh, yes, and of course, John, thank you as always for coming on the show. An incredible interview. So much, uh, so much gnosis. And for the audience, we have only scratched the surface. His book will take you on a journey. And where can the audience find out more about you on the internet? I would point to two things. First, I would point to sophianicmyth.org. There is a four-minute video introducing the Sophianic myth, and anyone who subscribes just by uh, an email and a username can receive every, I think it's every four days, you receive one of the nine episodes of the myth. So it's all free. You can, all, you can learn it that way. Familiarize yourself with the premium intel on the planet. And then, of course, there is the Modern Mystery School, Nemeta, N-E-M-E-T-A, dot org. And uh, there's an enormous amount of free material on Nemeta as well. So I invited anyone to come and join us. There's an open forum. There's a members forum. And that's where we jam. Awesome. Well, you heard it here, and I will have it on the show notes uh, for those of you who want to learn more. Well, John, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show, and uh, best of luck with the 15-year anniversary of Nod in His Image, and we hope there's many other anniversaries to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was really anticipating this call because I know I could just relax <laughs> and be myself. <laughs> and just be as insufferable as I love to be, and you wouldn't mind. <laughs> so we'll talk again soon, I hope. I hope Thanks so, so too. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there you have it. The first part of our interview with John Lamb Lash. Isn't his cosmology and system so darn cool? In our second part, John will give us his views on the Gnostics and their alleged world-hating and body-hating. 
He'll certainly give us his opinion on the lockdowns and the last year in general. Buckle your seatbelts for this one. We'll go back in time and discuss the mystery religions, Hermeticism, and Hypatia of Alexandria. Then come back to our days so John can share on the Matrix and Philip K. Dick. John will grant us his definition of gnosis and insights on Gnostic texts like Thunder the Perfect Mind, and much more. So please become a Patreon or AB Prime member for the full cosmic drama. Or these days you can get all full shows on Rockfin. Only $6.99 a lunar cycle, or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. You won't find this Gnostic or Hermetic content or many of our guests anywhere in cyberspace or even meat space. When you subscribe, it will cost you about a buck per episode, and that's a deal of many lifetimes. Membership includes full access to more than 14 years of quality interviews. It includes an invitation to the Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Facebook group and the Discord channel where many past guests hang out there and I'm always there to answer your questions. Even support in the form of some shekels to PayPal or the US mail really, really helps. Don't forget I'm offering voiceover services if you need some audio for your projects. I also have the merch store and an Amazon wish list as I always need equipment in this universe of entropy. The Finding Hermes program is live, and so are our virtual Alexandria exclusive private meetings that include exercises loyal to the ancient Gnostics, and a whole lot of stimulating conversation and a Q&A. I've already given lessons on Gnostic chants, vowel magic, sex magic, entheogens, astral ascents, mystical Eucharist, and much more. If you want to understand and experience in its full impact and liberating secrets, become an official citizen of the virtual Alexandria. Lastly, I am now on Odyssey and Rockfin, moving away from the larger digital domains and going to places that don't censor and accept crypto. Check me out there. You can do so many wonders, I just know it. I just know it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself. Your true self. Full of bold speech and gnosis. Here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always. <laughs>